For the past couple of years, I've been running the Zima board single board computer as my home media slash NAS system, coupled with a couple of hard drives. It's been working flawlessly, but this year my needs have changed, and they demand something a little bit bigger. Today I'm going to talk about why I'm making this change and how this is the best do-it-all NAS for 2025. At the end of 2020, I built and deployed my first DIY NAS server, utilizing a Raspberry Pi and a singular hard drive. Leveraging Open Media Vault, this was a perfectly adequate home media server. But as my desire to add more hard drives for redundancy and space grew, so did my needs. So almost two years later, I migrated to the Zima board. This SPC outdid the Raspberry Pi in a couple of important areas such as an Intel processor offering more efficient hardware accelerated features and dual SATA ports allowing me to connect an additional hard drive. It used hardly any more power and made available a large library of ready to use Docker applications. But with only two hard drive ports, any future expansion is significantly limited if I wanna make use of the drives that I already have. And this is how we arrive at today's project where I'm running out of space and processing headroom to do new things like running Minecraft servers and running a frigate NVR with local AI features. These are shortcomings I've addressed with my new NAS for 2025. So it's time to be out with the old and in with the new. I'm getting rid of this case and the Zima board inside it, but I'm gonna pilfer the hard drives for reuse in my new NAS. And as for the hardware of this new system, this is broadly what I'm gonna be using. If it wasn't immediately obvious, I'm moving to a full-blown desktop x86 based system. NVMe storage will house the operating system. I fitted it with 64 gigabytes of RAM and the processor I'm using is going to be the Core i5-8500. An older processor but more than capable in this role. Now a non-ITX motherboard and extra hard drives demands extra space. I ended up going with the most affordable PC case I could find with 8 bays and it's the Fractal Define R5, a very popular choice in the NAS space. It is so because it has a lot of great features, like modular drive bays, modular fan intake and exhaust locations, filters for all of the fans, and sound deadening material on all the panels as well. So after installing the brains of this system into the case, I can now talk about how I might make use of eight drives. With the motherboard I chose only supporting up to six hard drives, I'll need a device to be able to connect to more hard drives than that. Enter the HBA or Host Bridge Adapter. This device converts a PCI interface into eight SATA interfaces, theoretically allowing this machine to be connected with up to 14 hard drives. For the Windows VM that I'm gonna be running on this machine, I'm also gonna install a graphics card. The CPU has inbuilt graphics, so there's no issue with getting a display out of it, but if I possibly wanted to partake in some VM-based remote gaming, then a GTX 1070, the one from my recent budget gaming PC build video, isn't a bad choice. With that fitted, it's time to install the heart of the system, the mechanically beating hard drives. With the addition of a new 10 terabyte hard drive and a litany of one terabyte hard drives I had lying around, I'm adding these all to my system for maximum redundancy. With the hard drives in, the only thing left to do is connect them up to power and the pre-installed HBA. And with that, we have a system that's ready for the installation of my chosen operating system for this project, Proxmox. Proxmox is a hypervisor that will allow me to run a number of installations on the one machine namely TrueNAS scale for managing hard drives, Debian for all my Docker applications and software development environments, Home Assistant for my smart home ecosystem, and Windows 10 as a test environment slash possible remote gaming system. Proxmox itself has a pretty simple installer. You just need to select where you want to install Proxmox. In my case, that was on the 500 gig NVMe drive and give your machine a host name and IP and you're good to go. Once Proxmox has completed its installation process, you should be able to access the management interface at the IP you just specified. 
You will notice as you log in though, you get an error about an invalid subscription. And if you go to the updates repositories area, you'll see this is because by default, Proxmox requires a subscription. To bypass this, I need to make a couple of changes to the sources.list file on the machine in order for it to look to the non-production repository for system updates. Having made that change, we can now look to see if there are any updates that need to be applied to Proxmox. Following that, we can now get into the meat of this system setup. For my machine, I want to install TrueNAS, Debian, and Windows 10. So I'll need images or ISO files for each of these instances. Any images you want to use need to be uploaded to the local storage pool under ISO images. Now with all my hard drives present and accounted for, I'm going to proceed with the installation of TrueNAS scale. The VM creation process is consistent irrespective of what software or operating system you want to install. You start off by selecting create VM, choose a node, give an ID if the one automatically assigned is not to your liking, and give it a name. Then we proceed to select our operating system image. On the next screen for system settings, we don't need to make any changes for TrueNAS scale. So we can proceed on to the disk tab. Here we're allocating how much virtual hard drive space we want TrueNAS to have access to on our primary boot drive. The information provided by the OEM recommends a minimum disk space of 16 gigabytes, but I'd highly recommend more, i.e. 32 or 64 gig, if you decide to run apps inside TrueNAS. In terms of CPU configuration, the recommendation from TrueNAS is to set up the system with two cores. And likewise for memory, the minimum recommended is 8 gigabytes or 8192. I also set up my machine such that TrueNAS is the first instance of software to boot, and there is a delay of 90 seconds from the boot of TrueNAS to any subsequent software or OS. This should provide enough time for TrueNAS to get up and running before any software needs to access the SMB share that I'm going to set up. Now, a common way that I've seen in order to give TrueNAS access to hard drives is to use LSHW and individually add each hard drive to the VM's configuration file. However, this means whenever you want to add a new hard drive, you have to go through this process again, manually adding a hard drive to the hardware configuration file. However, instead, by adding the LSI to the OS's configuration file, all hard drives are immediately accessible and any changes to the hardware configuration of the drives is also immediately recognized by TrueNAS. All one needs to do is add the SATA LSI PCI card as a PCI device, making sure to disable the ROM bar functionality. The other benefit to running in this configuration means that smart data is accessible by TrueNAS, where this is not with the LSHW approach. So after starting the TrueNAS VM, the installation will automatically kick off, and it's fortunately a pretty hands-free approach. After a few minutes of initial configuration and installation, TrueNAS will be up and running, the address with which the web UI can be accessed will be presented, and hopefully we can see our hard drives and create a pool. In my case, as I have a lot of drives of dissimilar size, I'm pairing the drives up and running a mirror array. In my case, besides the required data field, I'm leaving everything else as default. So we've created a pool, which is our collection of drives with which we can use to store data. Now we want to make this a NAS and make this space available on the network. So under shares windows SMB shares, we're going to create a data set. Unfortunately, you won't be able to complete this operation until you've added user accounts to TrueNAS. In the credentials pane, you'll need to add at least one additional user that will have access to the network share. Having done that, you will then be able to complete the creation of the network share. So you've created the network share and you've created a user to have access to that network share, but you haven't yet actually given permission for that user to access that share. We can do this by clicking on the edit ACL button for the relevant SMB share, then clicking add item and then selecting the user you just created. 
You also may want to change some of the permission settings. In my case, I gave this user Taylor full control. With that setup complete, I can now see, read and write to this new NAS SMB share from a network PC. The next step in setting up this device is to install the Debian operating system. Once again, I'm creating a virtual machine with at least the minimum hardware requirements for a Debian installation. However, as this is going to be the environment that will run my Docker applications, I'm giving it plenty of storage space and plenty of RAM. The Debian install itself isn't quite as simple as TrueNAS. There's quite a lot of steps, but most of them can be left as default. The only significant change that I've made is to enable the SSH server. After that somewhat exhaustive process is complete, you can log in and we should be presented with a desktop. Within this environment, I'm going to install Casa OS, which is the same web-based Docker management software that I was using on my Zima board previously. Casa OS has a convenient web store to allow you to install common applications such as Plex, SyncThing, Crafty Controller, Radar, Sonar, and many more. But first I'm going to set up my Debian install to automatically mount the SMB share we created in TrueNAS. This I do by editing the fstep file found in the etc folder, being sure to make the edit as a super user. The line I've added tells Debian to automatically attempt to mount the SMB share with that address to the directory mount share that I've created using the SIFS protocol. With credentials found in the .key file that I created, UID1000 and GID1000. Now moving on to the Casa OS installation, we first need to install curl, which provides the means to download and install Casa OS. After that is done, we only need to enter one more line and Casa OS should be on its way. Not too long later, Casa OS should be installed and again present us with the web address for where the web UI can be accessed. At that address, we can see system information such as processor and RAM usage, storage utilization, and access the App Store. Having rebooted the computer upon completion of the Casa OS installation, I can now see that in the file viewer, the SMB share has mounted to the correct location as all my folders on the NAS are visible. With that sorted and working, I can now go back to the App Store and begin the installation of all the apps that I desire to run on this system, such as Plex, which allows me to manage and stream all my media locally. The final piece in this puzzle is Windows. The installation process for Windows is a little trickier, but it's by no means hard. The one gotcha with this installation is something that's not written on the box. Before kicking off the VM creation process, you need to go and download the Vert.io Windows drivers in ISO format and upload it to the same directory you previously uploaded any ISO files. This image file then needs to be explicitly called out in the OS tab when you're creating the Windows Virtual Machine, along with changing the guest OS type. There are some other recommendations made by the Proxmox team, such as changing the cache mode to write back and enabling discard because I'm running on an SSD. But after that, it's not too different from previous VMs. Give it the amount of cores you want, storage you need, and RAM you think you might require. In my case, I'm primarily going to use this as a software development environment, so I don't need too much space, but I will up the number of cores and the RAM. The Windows install will then commence as usual, with the only difference being we need to load drivers from that Vert.io disk image in order for the installer to be able to use the virtualized SCSI controller, network devices, and RAM ballooning. After the installation of those three drivers, we're good to proceed with the installation of Windows as per normal. After Windows is completely installed, you might find in Device Manager that there are still some missing drivers, and this is easily resolved by again pointing Windows to that disk image. What's not appearing at all though is my dedicated graphics card. Unfortunately, this is expected, and there's a lot of information circulating around about how to pass through a graphics card correctly to a Windows virtual machine. In my experience, the Reddit thread I've linked below has the best and most accurate information in order to get your graphics card working. 
It's not a simple process, and I can't really say it's recommended, as my results turned out to be pretty poor on the gaming front. Playing in the VNC terminal within the browser is of course not a great idea. But even with a remote desktop connection, gameplay will still quite laggy. I think a large portion of this is due to network latency, as the reported frame rate was more than adequate, but gameplay was not enjoyable. But hey, it works. So with the build and configuration of this machine complete, I'm calling it done. I now have a local NAS with media streaming capabilities and abundant storage. I also have a myriad of virtual environments and the ability to add more if I want to as additional software development environments or for additional apps. And that's why I think this is the best NAS for 2025. The combination of hardware and software make this a machine that is infinitely configurable. One thing I didn't cover in this video, as you might notice, is the installation of Home Assistant. If you want to see a video like that in the future, where I set up and configure my installation for my smart home, then chuck a comment down below. I'd also really appreciate if you could drop a like for this video, as this was a many month long project to build and configure the machine before we even talk about editing and producing the video itself. So if you get value from this video, a subscribe would also be appreciated, particularly if you want to see more of this kind of content in the future. But regardless, thanks for watching, appreciate that you made it this far, and see you next time. Christ, Subscribe and comment below if you appreciated it. Keep your heads in the shot.